Welcome, and thank you for standing by. All participants will be in listen-only mode until the question and answer session. At that time, you may press star 1 to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Deborah Denhart. You may begin. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deborah Denhart with the U.S. Commercial Service, Connecticut-based office. We're pleased to have you join us for Export Controls in the Cloud, our final webinar in our 17-part Export Compliance Series. We added this topic to our series for the first time, actually, this summer due to the growing interest in this area. As most high technology industries continue shifting how they access and store data, from on-site servers to cloud-based resources, the compliance challenges also evolve, and our guest speaker, Alfredo Fernandez, will share his expertise with us. Alfredo is an associate at Shipman and Goodwin LLP based in Hartford, Connecticut, with additional locations in New York and DC. He brings a vast array of knowledge with him regarding ITAR, EAR, and other related laws, regulations, and policies. He has brought his expertise as a guest speaker in a number of our webinars in the series as well. I encourage you to take a look at his impressive bio, which I will be sending out with the net replay following today's presentation. Now, many of you have received an email from me at some point. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions regarding any of the net replays in our series. We do encourage questions. You can type in a question in the area located at the lower right area of your screen, as well as audio questions we can address at the end by pressing star 1. Once again, Alfredo, thank you so much for being our guest speaker today to discuss expert controls in the cloud. My pleasure. Thank you, Deborah, and welcome to the final day of class, everybody. Uh, 17 part series. I know not everybody attended all, all 17, but a nice program put on by the U.S. Commercial Service, and I'm happy to be rounding out the program with, with session number 17. Now, based on the attendance list, it looks like we had a few folks uh, sign up for this session uh, by itself at, instead of the, the full series or a few earlier. Uh, so as we take a look at the agenda here, uh, We'll, we'll hit a little bit of the export basics, but because this is a, a somewhat more advanced course in the, the context of the series, we won't get into too much of the, the basics yet. Uh, we have plenty of resources for that level of training through the U.S. Commercial Service and, and Deborah and I, uh, if you'll have our contact information through emails or through the end of this presentation, can make sure you get pointed to those directions later. So getting back to the uh, agenda, let me start by, by reminding the audience here that I'm Alfredo Fernandez. I'm an attorney at Shipman and Goodwin. Uh, primarily what I do is export controls, international trade compliance, and some enforcement issues. Uh, so this is the world I live in. The, the client's questions have been growing when it comes to cloud computing, uh, how they're storing their data for big and small companies. So this was a, a hot topic that I, we wanted to make sure we covered this summer, and I'm glad there is so much interest in this session today. So we're going to hit the cloud computing basics. I would imagine some are, are cloud pros, and some have just heard the term and want to figure out what all this cloud nonsense is. So we're going to at least hit the basics so everyone uh, has at least some familiarity with the concepts we're, we're talking about here. Like I mentioned before, we're going to recap some of the export key terms rather quickly because the assumption is you're, you're somewhat familiar or you've been uh, participating in, in other sessions that have hit this in more detail. Then we'll get into the regulatory language specific to cloud computing and encryption issues and look at guidance letters that have been published by uh, the various government agencies with an interest in this topic, and then we'll address a little bit of the challenges you're probably seeing and some of the best practices for addressing those challenges. So by a little way of background, you will be seeing a lot of clouds in your forecast, and hence my goofy picture there in the top right. Uh, the cloud isn't going anywhere for the foreseeable future until the next technology comes around. Uh, and makes this one archaic, but it has moved into the next up and coming technology into everyday use. And by a little way of explanation, this is 
a kind of a, a nebulous term, no pun intended, to define computing services that are delivered over the Internet. And by these computing services, I mean everything from uh, network security, uh, storage databases, the software you use, the server and computing power you're using, uh, you name it, if it's kind of a computing service delivered through the Internet, you can say it's in the cloud. You're probably using it today. Some of you may be fully aware you're using cloud. Some of you may not know you're a cloud user yet. Anything from checking your email from your phone, if you log into your work email from your home computer through a webmail site or something like that, these are all clouds. If you're, you use Office, uh, Microsoft Office 365, you are using a cloud software suite there. You're, any movies you're streaming from your phone or tablet, uh, you store photos, you share them with friends, they can access them from somewhere else. These are all cloud type scenarios. Uh, pretty common nowadays, so you, if you didn't realize that was the cloud, now you know and you're, you're most likely using it. Now, in terms of the categories of cloud service, these are just a little bit of definitional you know, calibration early in the presentation, and we're not going to go too much into the details of, of the, these different three. But just so you know how this cloud service world is configured, there's what's called the infrastructure as a service uh, category. These are the, the very bare bones uh, elements that you need for, for cloud services, server storage, network security, things you don't really want to be worrying about unless you're an IT professional, and in most cases you probably won't ever care uh, about what's going on with your IAAS. Uh, secondly, your platform as a service may apply to you as a, again, as an IT professional, and probably not if you are just a, a software user. Uh, but the platform as a service comes with all those bare bones uh, elements in the infrastructure, but allows you to develop your own software and, and basically feed out the software you need to your coworkers, your enterprise, et cetera. Um, and, and lastly, the, the one we'll focus on more today is the software as a service. And this applies um, more for you as you know, anticipating that most of you are, are simply consumers of the cloud services or users when you use software, um, you know, apps, computer programs, et cetera, uh, from anywhere connected to the Internet. You're accessing something through a, a network that's not on the same premises as you uh, or on site. That's the software that's being provided as a service, and that's probably the most uh, consumer-centric type of cloud concept that we'll, we'll introduce here at the beginning. Okay, so a little bit about the why cloud computing gets its own webinar in this series. It, as I mentioned, it has become very pervasive in the, in the business world and the personal consumer world uh, for a few reasons. Some proponents of cloud will, will how the potential cost savings associated with uh, using the cloud. Uh, what, what you get to save on is the, the lack of hardware you need on site uh, and the lack of, of buying software that, that you keep. That what the cloud does is take away a lot of that hardware infrastructure. You may have a server room, et cetera, that, that's somewhat old now, uh, but those drive a lot of cost from cooling, keeping the temperature correct, uh, sucking electricity from the grid for you, all that kind of physical hardware and, and buying software for individual machines and things like that uh, get eliminated with the cloud. Instead, those services and the, the benefits of those things uh, are provided over the Internet. The, another benefit is the accessibility. As I mentioned before, you can really access your data, uh, your technology, uh, in your application, software, et cetera, from anywhere. You don't have to be tied into the network or specific to a company machine in the, your company facility. And for remote users, that's even more popular today, uh, having that accessibility for work from home situations is uh, a huge benefit. 
uh, performance and upkeep is another uh, benefit that's advertised quite frequently. You're not limited to the, the strength of your, your on-site servers and, and networking, but you get to harness the benefit from, from global or, or nationwide type networks of servers and computing uh, power. And in terms of sending out those monthly security update patches and things like that, it's a lot easier to uh, drizzle that down to the various uh, machines through the cloud than it is from an on-site um, you know, master computer server. And reliability in terms of uh, data redundancy and things like that, a lot of times stored data is stored in multiple locations, so if something were to physically happen to a storage location or facility, an earthquake, you know, crumbles a storage server farm or whatever in, in California, you have something in Texas or in Winnipeg that had the same exact data, and it just it stays available without a hitch. So, like I said, some examples of, of cloud uh, computing for you in case you're, you're new to the term. And on the other hand, there are some challenges with cloud computing, and, and it's very realistic that your company has not moved to the cloud, and, and this may be why. Uh, security and privacy uh, kind of go synonymous with the cloud. Even though security is improving, it's still a, an upward battle that the industry is, is fighting. And your company should realize that this is uh, a way to take data outside of your own security network and putting it in someone else's hands. That could, that could be good or bad, but it's a, a reality you have to acknowledge there. Um, and as more and more employees start using their own cell phones, their own laptops or tablets to, to remote in, so to speak, uh, into the data from their own homes or travel, airplanes, whatever it may be, uh, you are adding extra devices to your, your universe of secured uh, or maybe not secured devices and, and interfaces with the data. So you're just adding extra vulnerability in that sense, and you want to make sure you have accounted for that kind of, of device growth. Um, in addition, cost, I mentioned as a benefit, could also be a challenge. Uh, as companies figure out how much cloud computing they need, and uh, that may not be a very easy answer when you first start using it. A lot of cloud service providers have somewhat long-term service agreements that may fix in some kind of unit cost, like dollars per uh, gigabyte, dollars per hour, dollars per user profile. Whatever the cost metric is may seem reasonable in year one of the contract, but as your business grows rapidly, uh, shrinks rapidly, just changes its computing needs, whatever those long-term agreements or pay-as-you-go things may turn, to, may turn out to be a, a very significant challenge in terms of cost, uh, so that is a consideration to keep in mind if you are signing a longer-term agreement. And then integration is always a challenge for any kind of uh, technology system. You, you are still probably going to have some kind of on-site, uh, on-premises IT hardware, IT software even if you have moved a lot of it to the cloud, uh, but things like uh, syncing passwords and other security features, making sure uh, the networking and cable connections, especially for a facility with hundreds of computers uh, going through some kind of IT room, are playing together nicely because you're dealing with different systems most of the time and, and just making the user interface as smooth as possible is a, a good thing to, to keep in mind, but a challenging thing in certain respects. So shifting gears a little bit here, now that we've, we've hit the, the basics of, of what cloud computing is, and I hope you can at least uh, filter that down to explain it to someone else who isn't really sure what cloud computing is, and that was the, the intent of those first few slides. As we switch gears here into the basics of the the export laws and regulations. As I mentioned before, we're not going to uh, go into overkill with, with what an export is and is not because we've addressed that in, in prior sessions and there's other resources available for that. But as a refresher, we know the international traffic and arms regulations, controls, military defense items, technical data, 
Uh, these are uh, managed through the Department of State, DDTC. You'll, you'll see that acronym later in the presentation, DDTC. Um, so associate that with the ITAR. Uh, similarly, the, the other regulation categories, the Export Administration Regulations, or the EAR, this controls dual-use goods, meaning those that can be used for commercial and military uh, uses, purely commercial items, and some of the less sensitive military items that have recently moved over from the ITAR pursuant to export control reform. Now, this is done through a, a different government agency, the Department of Commerce, and more specifically, the Bureau of Industry and Security. Again, when you see BIS, you want to associate that with the EAR, and you'll see uh, all these acronyms a little later on in the presentation. And I do want to have that last bullet up here on, on the OFAC sanctions, uh, kind of the third regime of international trade compliance, and while not necessarily tied to exports per se, it is a, an important consideration into in uh, doing your due diligence to your, your partner entities, customers, vendors, et cetera, making sure you're not uh, stepping into a prohibited transaction with a prohibited destination country or individual or entity, um, as the OFAC list will um, dictate. So a little bit of a, a refresher again. An export is anything that's leaving the United States to a foreign destination. And the most you know, easy concept to think of is putting something in a box slapping your, your postage stamp on it and sending it to another country. But the exports can happen much more easily than that uh, in a wide variety of ways. And, uh, and that foreign destination I mentioned can be a foreign person. It doesn't have to be the geographic boundaries of a foreign country. Uh, so anything like a, a live or recorded conversation, a phone call, email exchange, uh, visiting a facility or plant, uh, emails, attachments, uh, a WebEx like this one, uh, and posting something on a company internet or on the public internet can be a way to export if you are releasing that information to a foreign person or a foreign country. So very easy to export and we want to make sure you're aware of that. It is, uh, we want to focus on this because this cloud topic isn't really about the tangible shipping box, we're talking about technology and software uh, changing hands, so to speak, in, a, in an electronic or visual sense. Excuse me. So in, the, in almost a year ago, September 1st, 2016, both these agencies, BIS and DDTC, released some new definitions that were largely intended to harmonize the the regulatory uh, words and defined terms with each other. So you'll see here I have an ITAR column and an EAR column uh, pulling out some relevant language from the definitions of, of export. Uh, these, let me tell you now, these are not the full definitions of export. I have the, the regulatory citations there at the bottom um, for you to get the full picture, but for purposes of the cloud presentation, I uh, wanted to focus on on some specific elements of the definition. Now I'll be reading off the EAR column, but you can keep track of, of the ITAR column and its parallel uh, structure to the left there. An export means releasing or otherwise transferring technology to a foreign person in the United States. And that, that should send up some red flags and bells for you if this is a, a new concept for you, um, because it's, that's very easy to do. But the there's a key word in release that we'll hit on the next slide, but it is important to know that releasing technology in the United States to a foreign person is deemed to be an export to that person's country of citizenship. So a fully United States um, conversation, U.S. person, foreign person happening in Connecticut or Kansas can be an export to a foreign person's most recent country of citizenship. Uh, you'll see on the ITAR column there's a couple extra ways um, the export can happen in terms of past citizenship as well. Now the, the prior definition of export included a 
the word release and the the regs have updated their definitions for release to mean inspection that reveals technology that is subject to the EAR or the ITAR uh, or oral written exchanges with the foreign person um, anywhere in the world. So when understanding what releasing technology means, it needs to be something that reveals uh, technology to the foreign person, which, you know, raises the bar a little bit. Uh, flashing something on a screen for, for two seconds is probably not going to be enough to reveal the technology to a foreign person that was in the room at the time. Uh, but if it's up there for five minutes, then it's a different question. So that's kind of where that's coming from uh, with the new definitions. And I'm going to have to start calling them the definitions instead of the new definitions because in, in two weeks it will be a year old already. Uh, so you based on the last two slides, we saw export, deemed exports, the release, it sounds like placing control data on a server in a foreign country or something like allowing a foreign person in the United States to have access to that data would be deemed an export. And you should be asking yourself, is that really the rule? Because that's going to be hard to comply with. And we'll get into some exceptions to that rule that are, are going to be helpful for this cloud topic. Now, I do want to note that BIS and DDTC have approached this question differently. You'll see some similarities in the coming slides here, uh, but you want to be careful you're relying on the right carve-out type exceptions uh, depending on which agency is controlling your um, particular technology or technical data. Uh, so providing that kind of information to a foreign person that would be controlled, it, the rule would be yes, that's an export, but there are exceptions to every rule. And an important exception here is what's uh, informally known as the encryption carve-out. And got down that site, it's 734.18 of the EAR. Uh, and for the next few slides, I'm only going to be focusing on, on the BIS interpretation of, of this topic. We'll hit a few slides on the DDTC analogy, um, but for now, keep in mind, this is only for EAR controlled data and wouldn't apply to the ITAR. So this rule confirms it's not an export or a re-export or a transfer, and those are all defined terms in the, the regs, to send, take, or store technology or software that is one, two, three, four. These bullets listed on the slide are critical. It has to be unclassified. It has to be secured using end-to-end -end encryption. It has to meet FIP standard 140-2, which is a um, an encryption standard in the industry. Uh, plus, it has you know six six lines, seven lines, eight lines, whatever that is of of words. It's a little bit of a a challenge to read. Uh, what the third bullet does is allows itself room to grow to match the evolving technology uh, and the expectations for you know, the, the state of cryptography in the industry. So you'll see supplemented by, by software, uh, cryptographic key management, or other procedures in accordance with the guidance provided in current U.S. NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology Publications, uh, or equal cryptographic means, meaning it has to stay up to date with the real life industry uh, based on what NIST is putting out there in its publications. And the fourth bullet is that it cannot be intentionally stored in countries listed in, in country group D5 in the EAR, and I give you the citation there in case you want to check the, the chart, it's at supplement number one to part 740. In addition to country group D5, the Russian Federation is specifically called out, uh, so just make sure you add Russia to that list of from the D5 countries. And so it's a pretty hefty list. Uh, list. I mean, there's um, it's not just a single digit number of countries, it's a uh, quite a bit of countries are implicated by this country group D5, so you want to make sure uh, you have an appreciation of which countries are in there. Now, 
by my my last little note bullet here, the BIS comments have included this note that data in transit via the internet is not deemed to be stored, meaning it's supposed to be read with the preceding bullet, intentionally stored in a D5 country or in Russia, uh, does not put the onus on the user or the cloud user uh, to prohibit at all costs something that gets routed through Russia or a D5 country on its way to its storage location because that's virtually impossible to control. Um, as when, when you're storing things on the cloud, it could bounce around to, you know, to eight different servers all over the world before it gets to its its uh, medium-term storage location. So um, BIS clarify that they're not expecting you to know every route for your data in transit. It's really um, a focus on where it is intentionally stored. Uh, so with the NTN, excuse me, end-to-end -end encryption I highlighted there in the red because we're going to look at what the definition means because BIS gave us a definition for that new term that didn't exist before last year's rules. Uh, and I'm not going to get much into what unclassified means because that's pretty straightforward. Um, and I won't get too much into uh, what SIPs 1402 or the prevailing industry cryptography standards means because it's a uh, overly technical for this kind of, of meeting. Uh, but we can uh, answer questions and, and take a look at resources offline if that's of interest. Uh, but always, of course, you want to keep your IT folks that understand uh, that industry and those terms and terminology uh, in this decision if you ever find yourself relying on this EAR carve-out at 734.18. So as I mentioned, there is a definition for end-to-end -end encryption in the uh, EAR. It means the provision of, of encryption of data such that the data is not unencrypted between the originator and the recipient. And the means or the way to decrypt it is not provided to any third party. Now, there is clarification that the originator and the recipient is allowed to be the same person. And, and the ability to access data, technology, software in encrypted form that satisfied the criteria on the previous slide is not a, is not an export of technology or software. And I'm going to unpack those three bullets now, uh, but did just want to get through the, the extra language from the regs here. Uh, if you are encrypting data before it gets stored, or as you store it, sometimes it's a, a um, something that happens at the same time as you, as you hit save or, or drag something into a storage file. Uh, and it stays encrypted until someone, an authorized user, opens it back up, accesses the file, et cetera. Uh, that is that is end-to-end -end encryption. It can't be decrypted in the middle uh, and then re-encrypted before it gets to the recipient with, with some exceptions uh, here and there. Um, but working with your IT folks to understand the end-to-end -end encryption definition and making sure your cloud service provider uh, understand that, that that would be a requirement for you if you are relying on this carve-out is an important uh, a best practice for you. Um, and you don't have to be sending it to someone else, as I mentioned. You can be saving something, for example, uh, on Google Drive. You just you have this cloud-based storage, you save technical data there, uh, presuming it's meeting all the other four criteria, and I, I don't know that it is or that it's not, uh, you go back, you access your own document, no one else has access to it. Uh, that's okay if it's encrypted end-to-end. -end. Uh, and then this last bullet, what it really means, and I'll summarize this on the next slide too, is that you as a U.S. person that would be authorized to, to access this data, uh, if you are accessing it from a foreign country, accessing it in encrypted form, even in, in a foreign geography, 
won't constitute an export, uh, even if you're seeing something in, in France, if you're the only one seeing it and you are authorized as a U.S. person to see it. Now, with uh, there's an extra note on the next section in the EAR 734.19 that providing access information uh, is essentially the same thing as providing the technology or software itself. If the technology or software would have needed a license for a particular recipient, providing somebody the password or the encryption key or, you know, whatever kind of security measure, the means to get to it, uh, you can't get out of the licensing requirement just by adding one layer of quote-unquote protection. Um, so handing somebody the password to go get something is essentially treated as the same thing um, if you had just given the something uh, to the foreign person directly. And here, this is the, uh, the takeaway slide I referenced just a minute ago taking those regulatory uh, definitions, the languages, the sections, uh, we can kind of boil it down to these, these takeaway points. Companies in the United States can use cloud services like the software we had talked about to transfer, store, access, EAR data, uh, technology software without the standard licensing requirement uh, process. Um, that apply to the, the given ECCNs of, of the technology or software if their systems are meeting those four carve-out criteria on the prior slide. Again, uh, somewhat distinct but similar, U.S. persons overseas can, again, use cloud services uh, to access their data, even if the ECCN would require a license for that particular country if you are meeting those four criteria. So needless to say, understanding whether you are on the right side of those four criteria is an important step in your um, decision to, to rely on that carve-out provision. So we're going to hit a couple uh, BIS advisory opinions before we shift gears a little bit to the ITAR side of this. And some of these are, are now getting a little old, and, and you'll see the they've been mostly geared towards uh, cloud service providers as opposed to exporters using uh, a cloud service. Uh, advisory opinions through BIS are, are useful documents. They don't carry the weight of law because it's just a letter that was a response to a specific question received from industry. Oftentimes the names are, are redacted to protect the innocent, and um, and BIS decides, you know what, it would be helpful for industry to just see our response to this uh, because it's probably a pretty common question that we're, we're seeing a lot of or we would think uh, a lot of people are interested in seeing. So in 2009, uh, they released an advisory opinion, uh, and again, this is only for applicability to the EAR. Uh, that cloud providers are not considered exports, exporters excuse me, uh, when, when they have their customers using cloud services. They are just providing the cloud services. They are not the ones exporting. Before this advisory opinion, that had never been flat out said by the government. So it was a useful baby step. Uh, more specifically, the provision of cloud services is not something that is subject to the EAR. However, BIS noted that if the cloud service provider has to provide software to its user, that might be subject to the EAR, uh, but didn't get into much more detail than that. Uh, but keep this in mind, if you're a cloud service provider, someone needs to download a specific driver or some kind of interface software uh, to be able to use your product, uh, but you have to send that to a foreign country, you want to make sure that transmission of software uh, is authorized, whether by a license or an exception or whether no license might be required, but that's an analysis that has to be done. But really it only applies 
<clears throat> to cloud service providers, and on the assumption that most of the audience is not a cloud company, uh, we won't get into too many uh, nuanced details there. Uh, again, more for the, the service providers, BIS reminded them in the letter, uh, you can't knowingly violate uh, prohibitions with weapons of mass destruction, or excuse me, weapons of mass destruction development, uh, embargoed countries, uh, some of the, the license exceptions uh, also would not apply. The, there's a, an exception called APP that how it's written says this does not apply for for nationals of, of these five embargoed countries, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, and Syria. Uh, BIS, in that advisory opinion, said if, if it's impossible to tell, uh, if it's indistinguishable who's accessing what, you know, that, that uh, APP exception uh, prohibiting those particular countries wouldn't apply in that case. Uh, like I said, it, these probably won't affect your uh, business all that much, but did want to summarize the advisory opinion for, for completeness. And again, they remind you, don't forget about the OFAC restrictions on prohibited parties. Uh, moving on to the the second cloud advisory opinion from BIS, this was a couple years later in 2011, a little shorter, easier takeaway. Uh, BIS says that cloud providers are now required to obtain licenses for, for deemed exports to non-U.S. IT admins, uh, where their job is simply to maintain and service the cloud computing systems. If a, an error comes up, they need to troubleshoot this behind the scenes, they're not accessing the data per se. Uh, cloud service providers nor the exporters are required to uh, go seek licenses for the country of citizenship uh, of those particular uh, employees. And because I had a little more room on this slide, I did add a link to the, the advisory opinions page. Not all of them deal with cloud computing, but if you wanted to see the full letters, uh, if any of these particularly interest you and you want to get the, the full scoop, uh, please feel free to, to check out the BIS website and they're, they're all hyperlinked there and you can pull them up. And the last BIS cloud opinion is uh, the, most, the most recent here, obviously in 2014 still, uh, not as, not very, very fresh, but of the three, the, the most recent. And this happened before the, the new regulatory language and definitional updates last year. Uh, this is a, a pretty narrow scope. It does clarify that, that cloud-based storefronts um, where a user could send something up to a website, the website owner processes data in whatever way they, they need to for their business and send something back to the user. Uh, that without the, the exchange of software in that kind of transaction, BIS clarifies that there is no export of software, and by extension, there would be no license requirement for the export of software. Uh, for that kind of transaction. Now, BIS is careful to narrow this scope down to only software. Um, if there's an exchange of technology, that has to be uh, further analyzed for, in terms of export compliance. Um, but if you, as a cloud-based storefront, are not providing a foreign user, let's say, uh, any software to use your system, then you don't have to worry about the export of software in that kind of scenario. So again, these are very narrow advisory opinions because they are, BIS is replying to this specific question asked of them, um, and like a good person on a, a witness stand, they are answering the question asked with as few words as possible and nothing more. Um, so you have to keep in mind that uh, the applicability can be somewhat limited uh, and stretching or extrapolating what that might mean uh, comes with some inherent risk and and because it's not law as I mentioned it's not uh, legal precedent it's just a helpful indicator but not the the final answer for anything but gives you an idea of, of BIS's position on on a given fact set 
Now, that that was the the summary of where we are with cloud computing in terms of the BIS and uh, and the EAR. Shifting gears to the the somewhat analogous uh, discussion for the ITAR under DDTC, and you'll see I only have two or three slides on the ITAR because DDTC has not provided as much uh, information and guidance and regulatory updating as BIS. But the, the key regulatory provision is ITAR 125.4, uh, more specifically the Section B9, which carves out from licensing requirements technical data, uh, or my, uh, too many words on this slide, technical data exported uh, by or to a U.S. person or a foreign employee uh, of a U.S. person, a U.S. company's foreign employee uh, traveling abroad as long as it meets these restrictions. It's uh, only possessed or used by a U.S. person or an authorized foreign person, meaning someone who's licensed to see the data, and uh, sufficient security precautions are taken. Now, what does sufficient security precaution mean? That's a pretty, pretty broad term and non-defined. Luckily, the, the language has this last bullet here to define what the ITAR considers sufficient security precautions. That includes the encryption of technical data, using secure networks like VPNs, uh, using passwords and access restrictions, uh, and firewalls, network security, et cetera, to prevent unauthorized access. So that adds some clarity, but still uh, it's a little open-ended as to what sufficient security precautions mean. Um, how sufficient is sufficient in the eyes of DDTC, uh, not exactly clear yet. Um, and you'll see it's not nearly as defined as, as the EAR has recently been updated. Now, we have one governmental guidance opinion from DDTC on this point, uh, and clearly just from only needing one slide before this, the, the regulatory language is pretty short um, and somewhat high level. So this particular advisory opinion, which is helpful, but again, uh, somewhat limited in usability, uh, was a question from a company called Perspexis. And, and they, what they do is they tokenize data, meaning that uh, they'll take a, a, some kind of sensitive string of data, credit card numbers, personal information, whatever, replace it with a bunch of random characters, and they'll have the master panel to detokenize it when it gets to its final destination so that in transit, uh, anyone who intercepts it only sees mumbo jumbo and it's, um, it's useless and unless you have the, the ability to detokenize. So Perspective says this is our our service, is it enough to satisfy your ill-defined sufficient security precaution term in the ITAR so that folks can use our service uh, and feel comfortable that they are um, doing enough to meet that criteria? So the answer from DDTC was, yeah, it would be enough if uh, if sufficient means are taken to ensure technical data is only viewed by U.S. persons who are employees of the U.S. government or a U.S. company, or technically a U.S. corporation, uh, at all phases, and the technical data must be sent by a U.S. person uh, who's a U.S. Uh, government employee or a U.S. corporation employee. So it added this extra um, extra definition to a particular question here. Uh, interestingly enough, on, on this advisory opinion, Perspexis published something on its website kind of flaunting groundbreaking guidance from DDTC that their product meets, um, meets this criteria, et cetera, and, and DDC, DDTC caught wind of how they were uh, communicating the advisory opinion results. 
DDTC did not agree at all with how Perspective was advertising and, and characterizing its answer. Uh, so in an interesting uh, development, it issued a, a follow-up letter to further clarify itself as DDTC. Uh, and they said their advisory opinion was not intended to, to imply that sufficient means uh, even exists today, let alone uh, that tokenization meets the sufficient means definition, uh, and that it, it emphasized, again, that this is limited to uh, access to technical data by U.S. persons who are employed by U.S. governments or U.S. corporations. Uh, transfers to any foreign persons involved in that process would require separate licensing. Uh, and I'll note here as well, even though these are publicly available documents now, these were not published as formal advisory opinions by DDTC. Um, so they, again, relying on, on these is, comes with some risk. Uh, it is a useful data point, but it's not the final answer for most of you, of course. Um, and the fact that it wasn't a formal advisory opinion even adds a little bit of, of marginal risk. Uh, to relying on it again, so you know, you know the the fact that DDTC is saying, yeah, this is our standard. You need sufficient means, uh, sufficiently secured uh, protections, and then they they say that technology may not even exist yet. It's a a little disconcerting because uh, they may have they put out a you know in theory an impossible type uh, standard to meet. Uh, but you can use this advisory opinion and the regulatory language uh, to kind of gauge your risk when it comes to using cloud and encryption for um, for ITAR control data. And to uh, to begin wrapping up the webinar here and, and move into some Q and A, I uh, listed some some compliance challenges and, and best practices to deal with them. And interestingly, as I was writing my best practices slides and my compliance challenges slides, I realized they were essentially two sides of the same coin. So they're merged into one uh, because the best practices are those that address you know, the, the compliance challenges that come with this new technology. And Assessing and, and meeting these applicable, applicable carve-out criteria uh, is the best practice and the challenge, of course. Uh, so working with your, uh, your government procurement teams to figure out the, is it classified or unclassified, uh, working with your IT security folks or external consultants um, to the, feel out the end-to-end -end encryption, are you meeting those? Uh, working with IT security folks, again, to understand what that that FIPS 1402 standard really means, and what is the current state, uh, as documented by NIST, of of encryption, and making sure uh, with your cloud service providers that you are protected enough um, that you're not intentionally storing things in a D5 country, um, as the list uh, has all those D5 countries um, out there. Uh, plus Russia in that category. So those are uh, the four steps for the BIS one, and of course for um, for DDTC, use the um, make sure the right U.S. person, U.S. employee uh, requirements are in your favor there. If you ever find yourself relying on the the ITAR carve out, uh, but working with the various departments within your enterprise is an important step in, in your compliance practice. Classifying your technology uh, and your software and understanding the license requirements for each. This is a big challenge, especially if you have a lot of products um, and, and technical data that goes with a lot of products and you have you know, 100,000 part drawings or even 1,000. Um, each You should be aware of what the controlling export classification and jurisdiction would be um, understand where your your risks of exports uh, exist because oftentimes the destination 
controls the license requirement. And which bleeds into my third point here, is that's appreciating the risk and, and your vulnerable points when it comes to uh, deemed exports that you may not realize uh, were happening or, or you do realize are happening. Uh, understanding the various ways to, to violate the regs, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, is an important part of making sure you're in compliance. And that's... Uh, that involves figuring out security settings on your shared uh, network drives, uh, security on on intranet and internet uh, issues, customer portals, things like that. Uh, getting a feel for how could this lead to an export violation is an important step and a challenging one, uh, and based on the the size of your enterprise and your resources available to to go down this effort. Um, can be a very big ask. And on the fourth bullet here, negotiating contract language uh, with your cloud service provider to help you, you know, enter an agreement that's going to lean itself towards export compliance. Now, some of the, the bigger providers may have the uh, the muscle to not have to negotiate contract language and they can say take it or leave it. We have a thousand customers waiting uh, if you don't want this. Smaller companies may be more willing to to tweak some contract language and I've seen both uh, as to where the, uh, the storage can be. Uh, do you want U.S. only servers? Do you want, you know, global servers that exclude specifically D5 countries and Russia? Uh, figuring out what you can contract with your cloud provider is a useful exercise if uh, if you need to go there, uh, or your products require a, a no license or um, <clears throat> excuse me, it has some licensing issues there. Um, if all your products are or no license required, you have a little more flexibility in that sense. Um, but still, that can be a, a bit of a challenge working with with the contract agreements. I also added subcontractors there uh, because if you are, if you've contracted with a, a buyer that you are using cloud services and compliance with all applicable export controls and you signed up for that and you outsource some of your data to to another company to provide, you know, some kind of technical service for you and they use a cloud service but you want to figure out, did I agree to make sure my subcontractors are also in compliance with export control laws when it comes to cloud computing? Uh, figuring out your legal liability there is a kind of tricky, uh, a little bit annoying of a, of a compliance challenge. But you, as, as your business scenario may dictate, may have some leverage to force that down um, on subcontractors and, and your supply chain. And uh, again, figuring out your com your partners and their compliance, uh, spe specifically with cloud providers. If a particular company, you know, has a lot of complaints or has been cited with with poor data security management by the government uh, or a watchdog group or something like that, these are red flags you should at least be aware of uh, and address and assess your risk appropriately. Uh, training is always a compliance challenge, but of course, it is absolutely a best practice. Uh, in this case, you're going to need to make sure your IT staff gets the export control issues that go along with cloud computing. And on the other side, you're going to need your technical folks, your engineers, uh, the people taking purchase orders, et cetera, uh, to understand how they can use the cloud, where the, the technical limitations lie, where the export vulnerabilities lie, uh, that kind of training is tough. And this webinar, uh, for example, is is what I would call a first step in, in getting there, uh, but there's a lot more detail uh, and fact-specific, company-specific issues to, to go down. And then you want to update your policies and procedures to at least acknowledge that this cloud computing technology exists if your policies are geared around uh, the pre-cloud world, it may not apply anymore. You know, you may need an update and 
and updating policies and procedures uh, isn't the most fun type of work, but it may be a, a necessary step for you at this point if you haven't looked at it in a while. I think that might be it for us. All right. So my email, phone number are here. If you have some questions that you want to ask uh, offline as opposed to the, the call-in number or the text option here, uh, feel free to use it. Uh, and I think, Deborah, we can go to the, the question portion if that's all right with you. That sounds great. Thank you, Alfredo. Um, great. And just a reminder, if you do have a question you'd like to ask, you can just press star 1 and we can take an audio question or you can type a question into the queue. We'll just wait a minute to see if any, anyone has questions, okay? Operator, have any questions come into the queue? Thank you. No phone questions at this time. Okay. All right. Thank you so much again, Alfredo, for sharing your expertise with us. Sure. So, Deborah, before we wrap up, I yes. do see a text question oh. that came in. Okay. Private must have come privately. Okay. Oh. Okay. So, uh, it's a it's a good question. If it came to me privately, I'll answer. That there's no identifying information anyway. Uh, so. Uh, a U.S. company has a Russian partner located in Russia and a U.S. employee, uh, U.S. person of the U.S. company is going to be traveling to Russia to, to perform some software review and try to enhance it with the Russian partner. It involves open source data, commercial applications only. Uh, the U.S. company would want to connect back to its U.S. network first, you know, accessing information, and the question was, what technology transfer precautions should the U.S. company be concerned with uh, with respect to Russia uh, and U.S. export control? So there's a, I'm not going to, you know, hit the, the, the full legal analysis here because there's a lot of unaddressed facts, but generally speaking, for the benefit of, of the group, and something like that, uh, you want to look at the, the classification of the, the data involved, and if it's if it's software as the the product, the article, uh, or the technology that goes along with it as the uh, the articles in question, you want to get an understanding f for whether it's subject to the EAR. And I'm assuming ITAR is not in play here because you mentioned it was all commercial. Is this are these articles subject to the EAR? If so, what are the ECCNs or is it EAR 99? What are the uh, license requirements for Russia? What are the, um, and with the open source nature of some of these things, uh, you may be able to use the public domain uh, or published type exceptions uh, to document properly that these are not subject to the EAR because it's public information. Uh, you also want to, if you need to, get to, you know, steps two and three. You want to look at the encryption available through, um, through your internal system, if you do provide a cloud uh, service for employees, if a U.S. person is accessing encrypted data that was encrypted end-to-end -end, uh, without revealing the technology to anybody else, you may have some flexibility to, uh, to do that without exporting to Russia in a strict sense, uh, even if you know, the person is located in Russia and viewing it and pulling, up, pulling it up on a screen in Russia. Uh, now, the, the issue of, of data storage uh, is one we would probably have to vet out uh, in somewhat more detail, and, and the Russian origin slash U.S. origin nature of, of this particular arrangement would be something we'd also want to vet out. But those are some of the issues and, and flags that would come up uh, with a question like that, and I hope that's helpful for you, Art. Great. Thank you, Alfredo. And we did actually have another question come in. Um, and the question is, as far as we know, um, does BIS or the State Department use cloud computing and or is there a list of recommended or approved services? Sure. You know, I, I'm not in a position to, to answer that affirmatively or otherwise. I, I don't know. I would think 
they have some some form of of cloud computing at the the, the full federal government, um, but I don't know for sure. Now I, I do want to note here for the group that there is a uh, the DoD has been uh, evolving its uh, its federal contractor requirements for data security. Uh, the NIST, in addition, in 2014, released a cybersecurity framework uh, that would apply to a lot of uh, government contractors in terms of data breaches and things like that. Um, and actually, just recently this week, I believe the NIST uh, published an updated draft of, of a more up-to-date uh, encryption protocol, uh, which would actually play in pretty nice to our discussion earlier today. Um, in terms of the, the state of the art, so to speak, and for encryption. So uh, in terms of recommended and approved services, I, I don't have them that's a little beyond my, my technical ability and scope, um, but I'm sure we can, uh, we can connect you with some, some other resources to that question. Great. Thank you, Alfredo. And um, Operator, do we have any questions that have come into the queue? Thank you. No phone questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Alfredo, for sharing your expertise with us, and it's been wonderful. And um, that wraps up our series, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. This does conclude the conference. You may disconnect at this time.